Good afternoon, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session, Rumination with Andrew. Thank you so much for joining as we are about to discuss a very important topical matter. And this afternoon, we are going to be looking at the national debt in Jamaica. And we have been hearing um, from Dr. Nigel Clark and all these economists in Jamaica that Jamaica is on a path to prosperity and that the International Monetary Fund has done us well. That's the agreement that we entered into in 2013 under Dr. Peter Phillips, then Minister of Finance. And actually that you know program um, spilled over into the administration of the now the incumbent government of the JLP administration that was first um, started by Audley Shaw, he was the one who inherited it from the PNP, and the mandate was passed over to Dr. Nigel Clark, who is now on his way to the IMF, the International Mon Monetary Fund, uh, to function in the capacity as one of its um, deputy managing directors. Okay, so I think we all know that, but what we need to ask, the question we need to ask, is the debt really reduced? Has the debt been reduced? Because that is what we have been told. And there is a gentleman here. I think he lives in the diaspora, could be England. He has this English accent. He is Dr. Lennon. Um, I, is it John Lennon? Not Dr. John Lennon, right? And he is actually the founder of Let's Build a Better Jamaica, right? That is the He's the founder of that site. Um, he has written an article and he seemed to have attached this article, uploaded this article to, or it seems like Zara Burton, investigative journalist in Jamaica, uploaded his article or series of articles. Because she, it's two parts. A two part, it's a two-part series, um, Dr. J. Lennon. And she has it here that Dr. J. Lennon is an advocate for real change in Jamaica. His website is let's build a better Jamaica.com. So you can go on his website and you will see what he has to say about the debt reduction. And is it true that our debt has been reduced? Now, the printing here is really very pale. It's almost very difficult to read. But let me share my screen with you. And if I do make a mistake, you can see what I am reading. All right. So let's get into the weeds of our discussion and get into the matters of things, right? We don't want to waste any time here. All right, so let me share my screen. And it here that the appointment of Dr. Nigel Clark to the IMF, ability or reward. Let me see if I could make the screen a bit larger so that I will be able to see the words much more conveniently. Uh, my eyes are not, okay. What has happened to this Lord? Okay, so we have, we're gonna make the screen bigger. Yeah, and we can look at what's going on. Okay, so we have here the, the appointment of Dr. Nigel Clark to the IMF ability or reward. And this was published on September 11th, 2024. And let's begin. Crystalina Georgieva, the Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, IMF, described Dr. Nigel Clark as an exceptional public servant and policymaker. Now, they have high regards for our Dr. Nigel Clark, and we are supposed to also congratulate him for, you know, having the, such a very important image in on the global stage. I believe that he just follows orders implementing the IMF, the IMF's ruthless austerity program, which I believe, that's what he's saying. Now, this is what not John is saying, that I believe that he just follows orders implementing the IMF's ruthless austerity program, but that's what he does, which includes the growth of the net international reserves, the NIR. The country has been in desperate need of basic infrastructure for years, but under the People's National Party and the Jamaican Labour Party, the NIR has grown from around 1 billion in 2013 to, to over, now over 5 billion. So we have grown from that. The net international reserves have grown between 2013 and now, from $1 billion to $5 billion. Saving is important, but so is investing in the needs of the people. And that's what I'm saying. What is it that, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine last week, and I was telling him, what if you were to tell your children that 
you know, you need to go to college. And, in, you know, in the next probably five or three years or six years, they'll be heading to college, right? And, but you're earning a very good salary. And you're telling them that they have to eat bread and butter every day because you have to save for them to go to college. Now, you are going to, what, 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 what is that about? Because you're going to sacrifice their health, right? Their physical health and well-being for just saving towards college. You have to look at the big, the, the big picture, right? You cannot just sit and say that you are going to just save. They have to eat now. I'm not saying now that you're going to waste and you're going to give them, you know, very expensive meals, but you have to give them nutritious meals that will enable them to develop their brains and their minds also in preparation for college. It's not just about paying uh, tuition fees when or saving up to pay tuition fees when they would have entered college, right? You'll have to definitely have them live. Life goes on and there are needs that need to be taken care of. During his March 2024 budget presentation, Mr. Clark engaged in falsehoods to justify the austerity policy and failed to provide any tangible evidence to back up his claims or hypothesis. Now, this is what the media houses should be doing. But instead, remember what happened during his last uh, budget presentation and there was a lot of dramas and the opposition lead house walking out and, you know, it was just this, you know, great the theatrics that they were playing with us and people were just commenting on that. We like distractions and when they behave like children, then we begin to talk a lot about who is Dr. Clark and who is the other finance minister, who is the opposition leader, whoever they are, right? We begin to talk about them and we talk about the little silly things that they do and we do not focus on or we do not place a microscopic look, glance at what is happening with Dr. Nigel Clark's stewardship of the IMF. And I should not only blame Dr. Clark alone, we should have begun that process from Dr. Peter Phillips. But the same thing happened to Kim. We thought that he also had done an excellent job of or by implementing this, you know, ruthless austerity program, as the writer here actually describes it. Now, Minister Clark proclaimed, we are proud of our commitment and successful efforts to build up our foreign exchange reserves to the highest level in history and to provide a, a buffer that serves the best interests of the people of Jamaica. He then proceeded to explain why hoarding is in our best interest. And you really wonder with all of this high national, you know, the national international reserves, is it national international reserves? What is it? The national whatever reserves. <laughs> The I N I R. What do we call it? This is net. Okay, it's a net international reserves. That's what it is. It's not national international reserve. Doesn't make any sense. It's a net international reserves. What was I saying? Now, an adequate supply of foreign reserves is a signal to suppliers at Jamaica that they'll get paid. Madam Speaker, that came in useful during the COVID nineteen pandemic when we lost four billion USD of foreign exchange inflows like that, accentuated with a click of the fingers followed by a dramatic three second pause. And these are things that often are not carefully analyzed by our media. We have to analyze, we have to look carefully at what information is presented by the government because they do, they do dispense misinformation. Um, they do diffuse the misinformation. And oftentimes we think it's only the citizens who do that because the government you know, has access to information and they control the media. And we think that the media are authentic. The media outlets are authentic, right? Dispensers, diffusers of accurate information. But I dare say that is a lie. Right? They often tell you lies. And if you have uncritical minds, which the majority of Jamaicans have, then you are going to be deceived by what they say. You've got to do your own research and don't be mesmerized, manipulated by people who dress well, speak well, and act because they're your leaders and they're traveling and going abroad and they're traveling first class. As somebody was telling me that they, Nigel Clark and you know, other Jamaicans are the same. <laughs> They're not, all right? They are just not the same. Humanly speaking, yeah, we're all the same. We're all, but, you know, we understand that you have two, three, 
maybe four Jamaicans, right? Where different laws and rules and one can lie, the other can't, <laughs> and all of that nonsense. That was untrue. The fact is the largest proportion of foreign exchange that enters the country is via remittances and inflows were $2.9 billion in 2020 and a recorded $3.5 billion the following year. The increase of the net, the net international reserves to a then record of $4 US billion was further evidenced that his dramatic claim was false. And we knew that the, this is now an open secret that it, had it not been for the remittances during the pandemic, I don't know how Jamaica would have survived, right? So we have to congratulate all the members of our diaspora who worked very hard. What is very interesting is that we have not really had a serious conversation post-pandemic about why did we have the lockdown when we were living in a tropical climate? when there was not much a high rate of COVID deaths and COVID infection rates in Jamaica? Why did we really lock down and lock our businesses down when we know that we were a very poor economy and that we were an unproductive economy? Why didn't we find ways and means of producing during the pandemic? So that when others who were in lockdown, when they would have opened up, then we would have been you know, ready to export something Right, because it was were there what two or three years people were locked down in their houses doing nothing, and lots of people lost their jobs. While Mr. Andrew Holness, who is now Dr. Andrew Holness, was actually studying, right, because he had the economic resources while Jamaicans were suffering. And remember, he was the one when people were trying to buy their pound of rice at you know at local domestic shops, right, at corner shops, corner store shops there in their communities. He was the one suggesting that they have to be home at a certain time, <laughs> as if COVID, you know, had discriminated against time. They had to be in by what, nine o'clock. And if they weren't in by nine o'clock, his rules were so stringent and austere. Right? Now, this is the man who was sitting in his house, eating his sumptuous meals, and while studying, right, while doing his doctorate in law and public policy. This is the Jamaica that we live in. Whilst he was trying to, you know, uh, elevate his standard and to improve on his scholastic aptitude, he was there and he was earning his salary while Jamaicans were actually suffering. This is the sort of society, this is the sort of imperialist nation in which Jamaicans live, but they don't want to admit it because it was a pandemic and they, the government was actually trying to secure them, to take care of them and that they did not get sick, right? Uh, so, so this is the, 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 the remittance inflows to Jamaica. And we can see if those of you have, you know, you can take your, um, you know, pictures of it, you know, and your whatever they call the screenshot of the of this graph here, and we can see where the remittance inflows and it went up dramatically during the pandemic because you know the you know people were concerned about their families and rightly so, right? So they were. So look at how the net. International reserves have grown from 1976 to 2022. Something I told you yesterday that, and I'm going to talk about the history of the IMF in another in subsequent videos, but the fact is that we entered the IMF in 1963. So I was also reading another article in which they said that half of our independence life, and I would think it's more, we have been with the International Monetary Fund, but I maybe it's not more because we were not always with it, but you know, it, as far as I remember, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, you know, when we, you know, and there was some abortion of it, you know, there was suspension of, of the fund. We, 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 according to what we have heard in 1995, Patsy said to the IMF, but we went back in 2008, 2009 during the global financial meltdown. So, but the writer of the article was saying, not this article, but another article that I read was suggesting that, you know, for half of our years as an independent nation, we have been in the clause of the IMF. Now, does that say much about where we find ourselves economically? I 
you know, will ask you to determine that. Now, he continued, tourism brings in three to four billion dollars a year, and we went down to zero. Foreign exchange flows like that delivered with another click of the fingers. So, you know, Dr. Nigel Clark has to understand that even if we earn three or four billion dollars, in the tourism sector, it does not stay in Jamaica because many of the, the hotels are not run by locals that are owned by our people. Remember now, during FinSAC, there was a hotelier, I mean, a guy who owned hotel, and he was talking about the fact that the government did, did want the local domestic owners of hotels to sink, whilst they were very much accommodating of foreign owners. Right. So what is happening now, if the money is generated, if three to four billion dollars are generated, it's not going to stay within the Jamaican economy. Right. It's going to go. It's outflow. A small portion, a minute portion remains, but the most of it goes out of Jamaica's economy. And that is why we have to produce. We need a manufacturing industry, which we do not have. And we don't hear any sort of discussion about re-enhancing, rebuilding our manufacturing base that we had at least in the 1990s and prior to the 1990s. Something I heard coming out of Jamaica is that the government, the current incumbent government right now in 2024 is awashed with money. And this money is cash. They have a lot of cash on their hands. And I'm wondering, how is that so? And where is that money coming from? Is the IMF giving them money to do their electioneering and then afterwards we're going to find ourselves in high inflation rage? Because if you have a lot of money chasing too few goods, we're not producing anything. How is it very good for the health of our economy, for the long-term health of our economy? I'm asking, I would like to know, because if we have a lot of money in the economy, it's not producing anything, inflation is, is high, things down there are high, and they're going to say, no, inflation rate is not high because the dollar is 158 to 1, and it has been so for quite a long time. And I say yes to that, but I'm wondering if that is true, or is that voodoo economics? Because when you go to the supermarkets, people are not seeing that. What they're seeing, they don't see any stability in terms of the prices. Now, if is it that the dollar is stable, as they're suggesting, and it does look at face value, why is it that people cannot have stable grocery prices and stable prices throughout well, the economy? What we see in Jamaica is this constant, this is floating of prices where prices continues to you know, go up and down. Well, it's more up, it's not going down, so it's, it's going up, right? And that is the, it, it, it is something that is, is ironic, right? That is perplexing, and Jamaicans really have to open up their eyes to look at these sort of, you know, imbalances, if you will, or contradictions, perhaps a better word. This was also true. Foreign exchange inflows did not fall to zero and tourism does not contribute U.S. three to four billion dollars to the economy. We know that that cannot be true because if that was true, we, I think we would have been a, a little richer economy, I would say. The figures include monies paid to foreign hoteliers, etc. And this is referred to as tourism leakage. According to the Minister of Tourism, Jamaica remains 40% of earnings, which equates to 1.2 to 1.6 billion annual. And all of that money does not go to the treasury. Right? Listen to what he going to say. The foreign exchange inflows that the treasury directly receives is via taxation. There were record earnings of U.S. $4.38 in 2003, 2023, I beg your pardon, but the direct tax contribution was only $336 US million, which was less than 8% of earnings and less than 5% of the budget. So his dramatic claim was another falsehood. Very important point that the, the, the man here is raising, right? The writer here of the article is raising. You know, one of the things also that I'm, you know, you, you hear coming out of Jamaica is that given that the government is awash with money, the government is buying a hundred or previously, well, just bought a hundred buses and, you know, but I'm asking, so the teachers are there and they're actually complaining that they do not have enough money. 
um, that they need a better salary. And so why not invest? You know, I was talking to a friend of mine. He's saying that the government does do what it wants to do with the money. The government has its own priorities and it does what it wants to do. Yet still, that friend of mine was arguing that we live in a democracy. So I said, wow, if we live in a democracy, why is it not the people? Are they not able to tell the government to channel that money to education, to healthcare, and to building infrastructure? But give, you know, fairness to where fairness is due. I understand that they are building roads and some of them are not being patched up. They're being rebuilt because they have long been neglected because of this rigid, austere IMF program. So it's full time that the IMF should have have us release some of the money uh, to do these things. But, you know, we have been in this austerity for over a decade. And do you know when you're suffocating a person, an economy for 11 years or more, I don't know if we can ever become competitive to other economies who, who continue to have been surviving and wasn't under such austerity. Whilst we were, we had to confront that austerity. I do not know why our government allowed themselves to have been trapped by such austerity, by such ruthless austerity. I don't know, but something, there is some chastisement, some, you know, castigation of Jamaica and Jamaican political leaders. You know, there are rumors out there that when Golding went abroad in 2007, when he had an interview in on the BBC, was it on the BBC? And he was saying, not, you know, not another one in my cabinet or not one of them referring to homosexuals in his cabinet, if that could have caused the anger, the angst of the multilateral um, organization. Another blunder of the, that uh, Golding's administration is when he refused to have uh, sent Christopher de Jos Coke when it was requested, when the institution was first requested. So we understand the allegations are that it could be also that both these scenarios could have, you know, generated, could have fomented this sort of extreme anger and chastisement against Jamaicans and Jamaica, the Jamaican economy. We don't know. And I think that Golding should have really told us what the truth is, because Jamaicans were the ones who suffered. He's not suffering because he's getting the same salary as Andrew Holness is getting. So when they bl make blunders like these, we are the ones who will suffer for generations to come. They do not suffer at all. So he needs, Dr. Mr. Bruce Golding, if you're listening to this video, you need to tell us what happened and why were we forced, and also Dr. Peter Phillips, why were we forced to have had such ruthless austerity in which the IMF, in the history of the IMF, they have never imposed such austerity on any other country, even those countries who were at a higher debt, who are more indebted than Jamaican than, than the Jamaican economy. They've never done that to any of these economies, not even African economy. Why is it that we were exposed to such austerity? I don't know. I don't know. And what we hear coming out of Jamaica from the mindless people are the, the fact that, oh yes, the government is building roads. And I'm wondering, you know, I hope, well, they're saying that the roads that they're building now are being built with cash. We don't have to borrow anymore. Or they're saying, and I understand if we don't have to borrow, and if we do borrow, we can borrow in Jamaican dollars. Is that true? Is that really true that we can borrow in Jamaican currency? I would like to see that. that you know, the, 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 I'd like to see, you know, the, the Jamaican government borrowing in Jamaican currency because, I, you know, I mean, who, who really even want our currency? It's worthless. I don't believe that. But, you know, I can't see, I can't deny it because, you know, if you can't, if it's not tangible, if I can't see it on the books and whatever, I will not say that it's untrue. But I... I am very skeptical of that sort of assertion. I do not think that our dollar, that anyone, you know, sees our dollar as a, an important currency. I don't think that we, our dollar has declined too much. 
right? We should have taken care of it. I think Bruce Gordon was doing a good job of it, of the dollar. And after we entered the new IMF deal, you know, things went, um, you know, amok. Now, no to investments. As a concerned citizen, he's suggesting here, I tweeted the minister numerous times about accessing the reserves. He has since blocked me on X because Nigel Clark is very arrogant, an arrogant man, right? He does not want to be challenged. And when he's challenged, he can't handle himself well. He doesn't handle himself well when he's challenged. He really does not know how to operate when he's challenged. Because, you know, he's coming as a bankster. He's, you know, he just wants to work behind. He should be working behind the scenes. He should not be working in a public office. He's not a politician, right? Because when he is cornered, he finds it very difficult to express himself. And the following statement appeared to be his indirect response. And I quote, some people me say quite innocently that hey we shall we shall have all those reserves why don't we just tap into it and use them to spend i understand the question but madam speaker it is those reserves that underpin the jamaican currency what does that mean what does that mean niger Right? It doesn't mean anything. And this is what I'm saying. If you are putting up money, it's like somebody just hoarding money and saying that they're saving and there's no investment for the future. So what happens when inflation occurs? You have no long-term investment. You're not investing in your education. You're not investing in healthcare. So you find that the doctors and the nurses are leaving in droves and mass to other countries and building the infrastructure of other countries while we're lagging behind. But we're doing well because our net international reserves is one of the greatest in the world. It's like somebody having a lot of money saved in a very depraved economy, in a very depressed economy, and they're saying they have lots of money. They have no investment, have bought no assets, and they're saying that they have lots of money. And then when the economy tankers, then they find that all of their monies are actually eaten up right? In that sort of depression. That's what happens. We have to invest in our people. We have to invest in basic infrastructures, roads, transportation. Don't just tell me buying a hundred buses because we always buy buses. And then, you know, I remember Jamaicans are always buying buses and they wear and tear and then you go and buy another buses. We have to have an orderly transportation system. Right, Mike Henry had a very good plan. I don't know if Andrew Holders has thrown that out of the, you know, out of the the, the 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 office. I don't know, because Mike Henry really had he had a vision that was the vision that was supposed to have been the vision that we have to have multi modes of transportation. You just can't have buses. You need to have railways, subways, right, to make Jamaica more efficient. Can you imagine if we had a functioning railroad? Um, transportation system and a teacher can move from Kingston to St. Anne because the island is small. The island is so small that you can move around from Kingston to Mandeville. You might have a class here and there and you can jump on the railway and get there. It's efficient. It's cost effective. Right? And you'll be able to have teachers and nurses and doctors and other professionals moving more from one end of the island to the other. Right, And it could solve, I'm not saying going to solve all problems, but it could solve some of the problems we're having with teacher shortages. Right, Because we could have some days a teacher might be here, another day might be at another site, and they're able to transfer not only teachers, but nurses. They're moving from one location to the other because the transportation system is effective and efficient and also convenient. But we don't have that vision as Mike Henry had. And I think that ministry is within the office of the prime minister, if I'm not lying. Firstly, I advocate for prudent investment, not spending. And here is an example to illustrate the point. Minister Clark thinks it is good management to spend 50 
um, million U.S. dollars on a new parliament building when under 40 U.S. million dollars could take all 180 high schools off the grid and save around 10 million U.S. dollars every year. Well, I think we need a, a new parliament, but that's something to be thought about. And this is something that we need to look at. I think government need to also present the budget to the people and say, which do you prefer? Ask them to vote. Which do you prefer? Do you prefer to have a new parliament or do you prefer to, to take the schools off the grid? You know, let Jamaicans speak because you know, the more we look at things, this is a dictatorship, right? We should have a voice in how things you know, are run. It's a country small. And the Jamaicans are intelligent enough if you give them a you know a poll or ask them to vote on whether they prefer, whether or not they prefer to have a new parliament. I would like to see a new parliament because that's the image of Jamaica. But the whole matter of energy and electricity is important for our schools. Right? So Jamaicans would have to um decide that. Right, they I will leave Jamaicans to decide if they would prefer to have a new parliament building as opposed to taking all the schools off grid. Something to think about. Something to think about. In regard to the reserves underpinning the currency, he inferred that stability is directly linked to the amount saved. Well, the data he presented seemed to tell a different story. Whilst the net international reserve has grown from $1 billion in 2013 to over $5 billion, the exchange rate has depreciated from 99. That's it. I remember when it was 99. 99. And I think it wasn't even 99 in, in, in 2013. Because when I was in Jamaica in 2012, it was 90. I don't think it would have jumped to 99 in 2013. So I think he needs to, he needs to check that. That. Um, that statistics. I could be wrong, but you know, I remember very distinctly that the dollar was 8990 in 2012. Would it have gone up to 99 in 2013? Probably because we were going through a very tough period, perhaps. I'm not going to deny that sort of this sort of information. From 1990, from 99 dollars, that's 99 of our local currency, to buy a buck to 158. Right. So it went from that, even though our net international reserves grew astronomically, astronomically. And Dr. Nigel Clark was here. Didn't he just say previously that, you know, the, 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 the whole motive for keeping the net international reserves and for it to be high is for us to control the dollar. That's what I got from him. So why isn't it controlling the dollar if we have all of this high net international reserves? Something that we have to ask the government. So the trend is the polar opposites. Applying the minister's logic, the JMD should have appreciated, but it has depreciated almost 60%. He went on to ramble that if we assessed the, the reserves to invest, we'd think we're better off, but we wouldn't be because we'd have high inflation and we'd think we're benefiting, but ultimately we wouldn't be, and it would be life, would make life more difficult, I beg your pardon. He should provide a detailed explanation of his hypothesis because the numbers indicate that investment would make us considerably better off, right? And that is, of course, true. Nobody can argue this. If we do not invest, then we are not going to be better off. 10 years after austerity, 11 years after austerity, will not make us better off. Because, you know, when we went into our search in 2013, it would have set us years behind. Maybe we were set even, you know, to be in the 2006, 2005, who knows? Nobody did the research. What, you know, how did this austere program, austere program, how far did it allow us to regress? Or economists, at the University of the West Indies and in other places should have explained these things to us. Instead, they just sat there and they were vertically repeated what came from the IMF. They were vertically repeated because that is what they're there to do. They have no brains to think and to think independently and to think critically. And we must listen to their views because their views are the views. Right? And only they have the intellectual acuity to determine and to understand economics. 
right? And I'm no economics, <laughs> economics genius, by the way, but I can say that as much as I'm none, I, could, I can see through nonsense. I can see when the Minister of Finance is speaking nonsense because you should be able to see certain signs. There should be certain signals in the population, among the population, that you say, wow, something is happening. A friend of mine, we always talk about the economy under Bruce Golden and that when we went to Jamaica in 2007, we could see that you know a robust economy was in motion. Was everybody wealthy and doing well? No, but you could see that the economy was doing something. There was something going on in Jamaica in 2007 under the government of Bruce Golding before this whole matter of the saga and the global meltdown. Something was happening. There was some livelihood there, economic lifeblood in the economy that we're not seeing right now. And we have, we people have not been seeing under the IMF. We're just hearing about the macroeconomic stability, um, but we're not talking about the microeconomic stability. What about that? Investment in renewable energy projects is sustainable and would create un unemployment, but uh, deliver proper solid waste management, deliver better water service, better funded education, and much more. Our water thing is also horrible. Why couldn't we also? develop our water in infrastructure and make citizens more you know comfortable in their homes with regard to water all of this I mean, it's, 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 it's really really disgusting to when we look at the whole summation the whole picture the full picture of the jamaican society investment would benefit the economy not jeopardize it as insinuated by mr clark so he doesn't want and they you know what they want is foreign investment you know, they want companies to come to Jamaica, buy up our resources or assets or prime assets, right? They give them tax breaks at our expense. We don't generate anything to build the economy. And then they tell us, yes, it's foreign direct investment, it's FDI, as even Bruce Golding is fooled and deceived to believing. If they were doing so well, and if we have had to buckle our belts and suffered so much, I think we should now be able to use some of the savings into investing in our own domestic projects with domestic entrepreneurs and not with foreign entrepreneurs who are there to exploit us. They just see us as another black nation in there, particularly the ones coming from the United States and also Europe. They're gonna see you as just, and anywhere else, could be Japan, could be China, just see you as another inferior black person. And our government behaved like that. When you see them, look at what happened at the PNP conference yesterday. A bunch of slaves just jumping up and dives Carter is entertaining them. What was that all about? Nothing, empty. No economic proposals, just to entertain you and make you feel good. The feel goodism. Let's get together and feel all right and remain on the plantation, right? And we jump up and we whine and we behave like idiots because we love it. We have embraced an inferior culture that I'm very, very, you know, I'm not sure we can be able now to eradicate a lot of the inferior qualities that we have normalized in Jamaica. Right? When you see people telling me, even people who should have some amount of sense, that nothing is wrong with Dr. Nigel Clark aborting a program that he was presiding over, Nothing is wrong with it. You know, and I'll do it too. Where is the level of patriotism? Where is the level of being principled and saying, I'm going to finish what I've started? Right? Because this is an economy that is on a decline. But, you know, well, in fairness to him, he's saying that it's, on, it's, it's, it's really on the move. <laughs> that we, he has, he's leaving us an economy that is in a far better position than it has ever been in the history of Jamaica. That is the impression that Nigel Clark is giving to the public. But he can fool those people who he wants to fool and who wants to be fooled. He can't fool me and the writer that is writing this article. Needless to say that I do not think there's anything to be proud of. Saving is important, but so investing. 
and in an attempt to try and justify the policy, Minister Clark peddled falsehoods and dabbled in speculation. And let me say something here. And the, the writer here is right, and he is, has expressed it very well. It's one thing for me, personal, to hoard my money because it's my personal life. Yes, maybe some of my family members will be impacted because they might need help and I don't help them, all of that. I mean, I don't have any money to hoard anyway, so let me just be clear on that. <laughs> right? I would like to help. Every, if I had all of this money, I would like to help as many people as I could help. You know, that's how I am. I'm not really a money hoarder at all. The... What we understand, however, is that if you do that to an entire population, then that entire population is going to suffer. So this is not only about a, a family suffering, but groups of families, hundreds of thousands of families are going to suffer based on Dr. Nigel Clark's lack of investment or investment projects that would generate jobs and income and all of that for the economy. Right? The Bank of Jamaica says that protection against inflation can be achieved by investment in real assets. Therefore, Mr. Clark could have discontinued paying unreliable Jamaica Public Service Company well over 100 US, that's 100 million US dollars every year to power our infrastructure invested in solar, which pays for itself within four years. So he has to pay 100 million US dollars every year in subsidies to power our infrastructure, right? So that's what, and they're talking about climate change and all that. So why don't they do that, right? And I think the current IMF in, um, agreement right now is about climate change. It, what they're doing, because we are in a current IMF agreement. Go and look at the Observer. I don't have the article here with me, but there is an, an article that was published in the Observer explaining, well, just really describing briefly the IMF agreement. They always have these fancy words. I don't remember the name of the agreement. They have standby agreement, liquid, all the nonsense that they give us, which doesn't really make any sense. Um, but they want to appear as if they're intelligent, right? By you know, crafting and coming up with some stupid uh, expressions. The Bank of Jamaica says that protection against inflation can be achieved by investment in real assets. Therefore, Minister Clark could, well, I think I read this already, <laughs> so, I, so we could have um, foregone that. The actions of Minister Clark are indicative of his commitment to the IMF. That is what he, this is the crux of the matter, that Mr. Minister Clark is committed to the IMF, not to Jamaica and to Jamaicans, right? Clark is committed to building the IMF, to enriching them, and to impoverish the Jamaican economy and the Jamaican people. So he comes as no surprise that they have employed him. Da. If you're thinking, that's what you're going to think, because this is an imperialist institution. Why are we bragging about one of us going to an imperial institution? Let his family brag about that. Let his friends brag about that. But not the nation itself who is suffering. His family is not suffering. His friends, I'm sure, are not suffering. But the Jamaican people are suffering. So we can't brag about Nigel Clark, one of our sons, going to the IMF, which is an imperialist institution without any conscience. Right? We can't, we, why are we bragging about this? What is so special about it? It's like, you know, during slavery, sending him to the same master's house to be a house Negro, which he really is, right? We're bragging. So the people on the plantation are bragging and, and, and he comes out there and he whips you. And you say, yes, master, yes, master, right? Because we are slaves on that grand plantation called Jamaica. And what is sad about it is that the slaves, at least, were not educated. So we could say that, you know, you know, if they were even to dance and sing, and and, and I'm sure they, were, they, they, they weren't doing that, because they were constantly having slave rebellions on the plantations. But they have sedated us with the cell phones and the, the movie theaters and, you know, and the nonsense that we see on television Jamaica and CVM. 
so you can't think critically and you're not thinking about important matters. Very interesting. Some think he will be able to impact IMF decision making how racist South Africa was a founding member of the International Monetary Fund. And that should be a clear indication of the position of the organization. Mr. Clark will simply be officially working for the IMF. That's what he's not working on behalf of Jamaicans and receive a fat salary to reflect his promotion while Jamaica is going to be suffering right for generations to come and make no bones about it his friend dr andrew michael Poles, is on his way also not sure it's going to be the imf but i'm sure you are going to call my name you are going to call my name one of these days you know i don't know if it's after his regime his government seems like he's on his way out and mark golding is about to enter jamaica's jamaica house right because that is how the show is run the elites, they take one out and they move one in and nothing really fundamentally changes. Nothing is going to change. Nothing changes fundamentally. Just style and, you know, governance, but the commitment to imperialist institutions is on the agenda because Jamaicans are not bright enough to perceive what is happening, right? They are just happy with the status quo. And those of us who are sounding their alarms that we're trumpeting, we're blowing the trumpet, blow the trumpet, trust the watchman, blow it loud for land and sea. Right? What a beautiful hymn that was. God's commission sounds a message. Every captain, or I can't remember the song, may be free. Right, I, I have sung that song for a long time, that hymn, right? Blow the trumpet, trusty watchman, blow it loud or land and sea. God's commission sounds the message. I think it's every captain may be free. Yeah, every captain may be free. Sound the trumpet, trusty watchman, blow it loud or land and sea. God's commission sounds the message. Every captain may be free. I think that is the lyrics of the song. Those are the lyrics of the song, I believe. Right? I haven't sung that song for a long time. But we have to sound the trumpet. We have to blow the trumpet. Right? Even though people are going to criticize us. But see, you are wrong and you need to listen to other views. Yes, we have listened to other views and we have lived long enough to see other views and that those views are not the views that we want to embrace at this juncture of our history. Thank you so much for joining. You know, it was a great time with you. Of course, it's not a wonderful time talking about the elected matters, but it was a nice, you know, a nice interacting with you, even though when I say you, of course, you are my audience. And I have to understand that even though I'm not seeing you physically, but I, you know, when you comment, remember not to comment. That's how I am able to interact with you. I feel motivated to come before the cameras and talk. When you don't respond, I don't have any inspiration and even though i come and chat that sometimes i'm just oh wow why do i even come here right so remember now to leave a comment so i can feel like i'm being connected with you and not with a camera all the best to you see you then have a great fantastic day or night wherever you are in the world